why social network analysis? Because it's the best fit for the phenomena. What's our phenomena? 1.8 billion humans have started to tweet and message and text and update and check in and like and link and reply and rate and review. Uh, so liking and linking and favoriting and following and friending and all of that. If you agree that, well, that is social media. If we ask ourselves, well, what is it that we do when we do this stuff? It's the action of creating these connections. And when I like your stuff, I'm creating a link. Mark at a time on a date has a like relationship with your thing. And in doing so, I'm forming a link or a tie or an edge, what we call an edge in Node Excel. Okay, so, uh, okay, it's a good fit, so, so what? Maybe it's a good fit, but it doesn't tell me anything. So let me now try to make this argument. Uh, SNA, or network theory, um, tells you some really important things you want to know. Like, what's the overall shape and size and density of this population? Is this confetti or is it a dense web? It matters. And so one initial observation that you take on when you become a network thinking kind of person, when you adopt network consciousness, if you will, what I like to do is call it uh, think link. That's what we want you to do, think link. Um, is that you notice that a hundred people or a thousand people could connect to each other in a lot of different ways. For example, a thousand people might not connect to each other at all, or hundreds of them might form one group and hundreds of them might form another group. So it's like a bucket of Legos, right? If I give you a hundred Legos, you can make all sorts of different shapes. Well, humans are sort of like atoms, but we live in molecules. We live in connected structures. No man or woman is an island. Although some people apparently are archipelagos, but that's a subcase. Um, so what, why do we want to do network theory? It fits the phenomena, which is to say network theory starts off by thinking the world is a bunch of things and the connections among them. Whereas statistical methods historically have said the world is a bunch of things and they have attributes. People have height, they have weight, they have income, they have education, attainment, and those attributes predict something about them. Put them into clusters, that kind of thing. We say, yeah, they have attributes, but sometimes people who are very different interact. And that's a connection. That's an important observation. It's important to look at the, the things between people, not just the things within people. Uh, what's the difference between a bus station and your home on the night of a, a big holiday when all your family is over? Well, we know intuitively, well, those are two very different situations. What do you mean, Mark? I mean, I mean that in a bus station, there's really very little chance that any of these people have any connection to each other. And if we drew them, we might just draw 100 dots on a page with no lines to get. No lines connecting them. But if I take maybe you have 20 people in your home on a holiday night, everybody's connected in multiple ways. You know, it's not like Uncle Harry only knows Aunt Sally. And that's, you know, I've never met you people before. It's a dense web of connections. And so these are sort of polar opposites, confetti versus density. And it just describes two different states of human populations you know, a community versus an anonymous crowd. Uh, there's that whole group, group one, and it looks like, uh, you know, it, it's like an army. It, it's a regiment. It's just a lot of dots in a big grid. And that basically, there we go. Uh, that basically is representing uh, a group of people who all have zero connections. And this is different from a lot of graphs where that kind of activity almost doesn't exist. In fact, if you look right below it, here's Game Developer Conference. Here's another topic. It's CMGR Chat. That stands for Community Manager Chat. It's what some social media managers call themselves. 
the older ones. Uh, in the old days, this was called online community, and online community had online community managers. And so community managers get together uh, every week, and they have a little tweet-a-thon. They chat to each other. But look at the difference between CMGR chat and game developer conference. Um, this has this enormous phalanx, a regiment of the isolates. Here, we've got this tiny little group. So what does that mean? It means that if you have heard of community manager chat, you probably know one of these people, and you're part of a conversation with other people. Whereas game developer conference is something that has such visibility that people all over the world talk about it without necessarily replying to or mentioning each other. I want to kind of put scare quotes around the use of the word viral. Um, all of these topics are active. The word viral, I think, has been used in a very inexact way. And I think if we use it in one particular precise way, this is not particularly viral. So if viral means contagious, which means that it is something that is passed along a lot, like you heard it once and you repeated it, when I heard you say it, it made me say it. That's not necessarily what we see here. We see a little bit of that. What we found, first of all, we made a lot of maps. We, we used Node Excel because it was easy. It was also semi-automatic. We set it up on about six or seven machines. We started to map hundreds of different topics, hashtags, words, queries, events, uh, usernames, anything that came to mind. We threw it on the server. We started to collect it. It would generate maps. We generated about a million and a half of these maps over about three and a half years. And after a while, the maps start to look familiar you say to yourself, haven't we seen a map of that sort before? And the answer is, yeah, you have. In fact, we were able to start putting them in piles, and we found that there were about six piles. And these piles are described at the bottom of the uh, first page of the Pew Report, which we called the six uh, network structures of Twitter. And I should note that we, we limit the claim to Twitter, but I'm willing to widen it a little bit. Uh, not all social media have the attributes that Twitter have. Uh, email does though. Um, message boards, discussion groups. Critically what I'm talking about is the ability to reply to another person. If you have that, then there's a really good chance that you're going to have these patterns that I'm sure are going to appear on my screen any second now. And uh, these six patterns come from the interaction of people with each other for their own, out of their own choices. Nobody told people, look, it's time for you to take pattern three and go and build that. They, they just did that. And they did that because an internal personal logic drove their choices. So you make a few hundred thousand, you know, ver ver million and a half maps, and you, you, you realize, we've seen this before. And what we ended up doing is, uh, we boiled it down to six patterns. I'll describe the six patterns. And I will argue, we're not saying that there couldn't be a seventh pattern. We're just saying that wherever people can reply, we believe these six patterns are very, very common. And maybe there are others. We should go look for them. But what kinds of systems don't have reply? Uh, things like um, wikis. You don't really reply in a wiki. You don't really reply in a blog. Um, there are different forms of social media. Let's say like a video game where it's really hard to say who's replying to who. Maybe people shoot at each other. Uh, so we're going to limit our claim to this is about Twitter. But I'll broaden it a little bit to say, I think you'll find these patterns appear anywhere people reply to each other. But very different patterns appear in things like blogs, the web, wikis, those kinds of things are a little different. 
So what do we see when we go looking? Uh, we, we see that people sometimes form two camps and they won't talk to each other. And pretty much every U.S. political topic looks like this. The interesting thing is that non-U.S. political topics don't always look like this. So America, we're number one in not talking to each other. Oh yeah, in, in the Pew report, what we do it, to, to illustrate how different different clusters are, uh, we measure the top 10 URLs from each cluster. In fact, we also measure the top 10 hashtags from each cluster. We measure the top words and word pairs from each cluster. You find this data in your Node Excel workbooks, by the way. Uh, it's on the groups worksheet. And we're able to m come up with a measure, which is how many URLs in group one are also mentioned in group two? How many URLs from group two are also mentioned in group one? We can do the same thing with hashtags. Uh, what did we find when we looked at uh, divisive U.S. political topics? What percentage of overlap do you think we found? Zero. 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 So if you link to MSNBC or NPR, or New York Times, you will not link to Washington Times, Heritage Foundation, Breitbart.com, Daily Caller, Michelle Malkin, Truth in American Education, a completely different set of information sources. They're not news outlets because they're not news sources. They're, they're not newspapers. Uh, Washington Times is supposed to be a newspaper. Um, so it's, it is a completely different ideological basket of resources and for that matter even uh, secondary hashtags. So what other hashtags do you use? If you talk about the president, you might say Unite Blue or Forward on Climate. But you might also say Seacot and you might say Rubio or Bush. And so you might use a different set of hashtags that go with that word. And in fact, we find that here, you know, we, we've helpfully colored them red and blue, uh, but we can identify the red and blue very easily because there is that polarization in, U, in U.S. Uh, political discussion. But interestingly, non-U.S. discussions have some polarization, but less polarization. They share more common news resources, for example. And so American exceptionalism, we're number one. Part, partly the, the happy story is the we're divided, we hate the other people, we won't even talk to them. We're not, we're going to talk about the same issue, but we're not going to talk about it in the same way. That That's only one pattern that appears in Twitter. There are other patterns. In fact, it's not even the most common pattern. It's relatively rare that you can get a group of people to all talk about the same thing but not talk to each other about it. In fact, there is another pattern, the tight crowd, the unified pattern. And this says, it's just us chickens. It, you know, These are all people who all want to talk about the same thing. And you can see this in here. Th this is a real world example. That's, uh, let's talk about US tax policy. This is, let's talk about being a community manager. So this is really a very dense group. It doesn't have this dividing quality. And so this is the opposite type. But again, those are not the only two kinds. There are at least six, because we also found these patterns where pretty much nobody's talking to anybody. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either. We found that Almost nobody talks to anybody when the topic being tweeted about is a brand. You said iPhone. I said iPhone. Does that mean we know each other? No, that's like saying you breathe oxygen. What do you know? Me too. I mean, half of Earth is carrying an iPhone. Well, give or take. There are what, 600 million iPhones on the planet now? In the U.S., there's a show of hands. How many iPhones are in the room? Okay, and how many androids are in the room? So that's everybody, right? So you're, you're one or the other. Uh, so brands often generate the ability to mention their name 
without participating in a conversation about them. And so this level of fragmentation is not necessarily a bad thing. It could be a good thing. You might even want to take a KPI and say, look, you know, you built a great community. You're a tight crowd. But what we really want to do is grow your brand presence. I'm going to take a KPI. Can I say KPI here? Is that acceptable? Oh, thank you. Okay. You know, not everybody speaks corporate. Um, you might try to grow the number of isolates in your graph because as I can show you, there are lots of graphs that have lots of people talking to each other, but there really are no isolates. What does that mean? It means the minute you walk away from that group, nobody's ever heard of them. Nobody talks about them. And so if you're putting on a conference or an event and you get lots of activity, good for you. But what we really want to know is, did you get people to connect? So connection matters. So let's go back to your first two questions. Why SNA? Because none of the other social media analytic tools consider at all the fact that a thousand tweets could have perhaps a thousand different shapes. And that the shape might matter. And by the shape, I mean, as you can see here at the bottom of the page, the sort of the, the pattern the crowd makes when you step back from the details of an individual talking to an individual and you see that a pattern emerges. These are connections, but we, what we are looking at are collections of connections. And I am a sociologist. Uh, it is my great pleasure, it is my discipline's core observation that when you step back from the details of individuals interacting with individuals, some larger thing emerges. Some pattern is there. We have a name for that pattern. We call it society. And, and, and we are the students of it. What you're seeing in front of you is societies in a Petri dish. All the people talking about one hashtag, all the people talking about one celebrity or some location. Perhaps there's a fire, perhaps there's a storm, and people are talking about name of place. And they form different shapes. And as a marketer, I will argue, I'm not a marketer, I'm a sociologist, but uh, you know, as somebody, if, if your goal is essentially something I will call max propagation. I've got a message. I want to put it out in the world in some way so that that message goes as far and as wide to the right places as it could. Is that not our goal? Well, knowing how things are connected really might matter. And I'll note that maps are often used for several different purposes. So if I unfold a map, one task I might use it for is to figure out where is my destination. So it, I might not even know where I want to go. I might just look at the map and go, where would I want to go? And if you look at the map of the United States, you know, certain places, no doubt like Omaha, just jump off the map. Um, well, I'm thinking maybe like Chicago or Atlanta, where, you know, like every highway in America converges in Atlanta or Chicago. That must be a place, right? So you look at that map and you kind of go, oh, well, there. And so maps help us pick out destinations. Social media maps help us pick out influencers. But maps also get used to, for another purpose. You, you have to find your path. And so, you know, Route 80 might get you to Chicago. Uh, the same here. We want to know how do we get to our influencer? How do we get a message to that person? Yeah, they, they are what we would call the maximum propagators. They, and we measure that in network terms with something called a centrality score. How much in the middle are you? So you can see that in these structures, it's easy. Some one person is at the center of a crowd of people who do not connect to each other. In this pattern, that makes this group of people an audience, not a community. This is a community, this big green bu bubble where everybody's talking to everybody. This is a community. Everybody's connected to everybody. But this, it's a group of people, and you might be happy that you have attracted all those retweets, but notice first that they retweeted you, but nobody retweeted them. 
and they did not talk to each other. This person, who happens to be Paul Krugman from the New York Times, who writes an article and then goes to Twitter and says, I wrote an article, here's the URL, 125 people retweet him. But do they talk to each other? Not in that cluster. I'll note that deeper in the report, we'll, we point out that over here in this part, I don't know if you can actually see that detail on your screen, but there are parts of the graph where people are actually talking to each other about Paul Krugman. But in this part of the graph, what we see is his audience. People who are willing to retweet him, but they're not talking to the other people who retweeted him. And so it's not that that's a bad thing. It's a thing. It's an observation. When people come together, somebody gets up with a microphone and starts saying, here's what's happening today. Groups of people form around those people sometimes, and they don't talk to each other, or they only minimally do so. It, we call it an audience. But those things also happen in social media, and we can see it. Discovery nuggets. Uh, and this is a guy who's all about big data. And he tweets up a storm, and he uses the hashtag KD Nuggets. Uh, he's the guy at the center of that hub and spoke pattern. He's a broadcaster. It's a very clear pattern. He's not much of a brand. About, you know, five or eight percent of the total population are isolates. But boy, does he have a following. And, you know, so as marketers, you need to start to make decisions about what kind of success am I willing to settle for? So let, let me show you the pictures of the three phases of social media success. I don't know if this is going to work. I'm going to try. Uh, but, you know, phase one is that you got an audience. Phase two is that your audience got an audience. But phase three is that you got, um, you got a community to grow. And why would that be good? Uh, because communities are active even when you're not. It's all about the volume, not the structure. And we're all about the structure and the volume. We'll count things too. I mean, counting things is good, but it's like, it's like seeing the shadow of the population rather than the actual structure of the population. I mean, looking at these pages, looking at these maps, Clearly, there are differences. You would surely want to see your map in the map of your competitor's brand. You know, I, the project I'm working on this morning is for, uh, you can see some of this in, in here already, Highveld. Uh, there is a, uh, a radio station in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. Highveld FM. And... Um, they compete against Jacaranda FM, and we're making maps because people tweet about these radio stations. P people often tweet about media. Media often play a outsized role in social media. And so we're able to look at this and say, hey, look, you know, you're a broadcaster. You get usually a single ring of retweet. You don't usually get two, but you have occasionally gotten sort of this is the inner ring and the outer ring of Saturn, if you will. Uh, but these are all broadcast structures with a little bit of brand and some smaller groups, twos and threes. And we can then compare that to, let's say, the Jacaranda map. And we can say, hey, look, you know, Jacaranda has actually been generating a lot more community. Or it's not just its volume, it's its structure. It gets a third retweet ring. It's got more word of mouth. It's got better propagation. So, yeah, I think we can zoom in on any topic. And, and our vision with this was, uh, I'll use slides, I think slides will actually work, maybe, uh, was that what people really need is a, uh, a, like a point and shoot digital camera. But a point and shoot digital camera that could take pictures of social media crowds, not just real world crowds. Uh, I'm glad you agree. Um, so what we're arguing for is the idea that if you look in, uh, Twitter, there are crowds in there, but they're invisible because that's how Twitter shows you Twitter. And the question I would ask is, is the person at the top of that list the most important person? 
No, it's just the most recent tweet. So I, I'll ask you this. Isn't there a, uh, a medical condition it, where you confuse what's new for what's important? Don't they call that attention deficit disorder? So Twitter is the ADD interface to this space. But the reality is that just the way that Mr. Obama has this crowd in front of him and it has a shape and there's a lot of information in that shape, this Twitter crowd about Obama also has a shape. It looks like this. Some people connect to other people more than they would connect to some other group of people. And again, I've helpfully labeled these blue and red. But you pr probably could have guessed which one was blue and which one was red just by looking at the top hashtags that are used in each of the groups. Now, at this point, you might ask me, yeah, but where did the groups come from? Good question. Uh, they came from math. They came from things called clustering algorithms that looked at all of the connections in the network and found that over in group two, that set of people were more likely to connect to other people in that group than they were to connect to any other group in the graph. And there are many flavors and algorithms for calculating this groupness. We tell you which one we use. We use one called Closet Newman Moore. Uh, there are two others. There's Wakita and Sarumi and Gervin Newman. Why do we call them these things? They're the names of uh, mathematicians who invent these things. We implemented them. So uh, imagine if I give you a uh, Thanksgiving turkey and a you know, big butcher's cleaver, uh, and I say, go ahead, chop it up. Chances are the legs come off first. And that's sort of how uh, a network algorithm, a clustering algorithm, segments a graph. It's trying to figure out where's the weakest link here, and maybe I should pull it apart at that point. Uh, Aristotle once famously said, carve along the joints. That's what this thing does. So, so the message is you want to take a picture of the crowd because most of the other tools just count the people in the crowd. And as you can see, that, that's not quite going to cut it. Um, I'll tell you why this is dangerous uh, if you don't do this. It, it's not dangerous if you do. Nobody has been harmed by NodeXL that we know of. Um, in the 2012 election, USA Today ran a daily report. They reported the percent positive and negative of the sentiment for the word Obama and Romney. I want you to think about that. It's a very attractive thing. It's a horse race statistic. It's great for political communication. What's today's outcome for the horse race? Who is ahead? But look at this image on your screen. If I say that there's a 14% increase in negative sentiment, what might you ask? Well, I'll tell you what to ask. That was a rhetorical question. I'm going to tell you. You might ask, was that an increase in the red people being more red? Or were blue people actually moving towards the red side? Are you reporting an overall shift in attitude? Or are you reporting a change in the intensity of an attitude? Well, of course, Toxie and USA Today say, but it's all one giant bag of words. It's all just a bucket of tweets. And we look at it and go... Not in my world. I don't see one big bucket of tweets. I see two groups of people who won't talk to each other. Why are you reporting as if they were all just one group? I have a very negative sentiment about sentiment. And I'm not, and I'll tell you, I am not a computer scientist, but I have played one on TV. And um, I talk to a lot of computer scientists. And most of them think sentiment is bunk. And I think so, too. I, I think humans are pretty good at figuring out the sentiment of things if they could read a summary of things. And I think computers are still, no matter how clever they get, not so good at telling me, well, we'll do it this way. If, if they're so good at telling me uh, some insight into this, how come they can't tell me what to do about it? If I tell you that there's a 14% increase negative sentiment about your candidate, what now what? 
So we have a project in the Node Excel project that hopefully will come out in the next six to eight weeks, uh, which we are calling uh, our version of sentiment. And I'll just briefly tell you that we will give you, the user, three lists of words, and we will initially load them with English language words that we will call positive, neutral, and negative. And we'll do the sentiment thing, which is essentially counting words from a list. But we're going to be different from the, some of the other tools because we're going to say, you can edit the list and change what we call it. So if you want to go from positive, neutral, negative to conservative, liberal, or undecided, and you can come up with a bunch of keywords that are indicative, if you say immigration in the word amnesty and I say immigration and reform, you can be pretty sure that we're not in the same bucket. And so we're going to make it easy for you, subject matter experts, to count words from lists. And we think that's what sentiment was all along. It just got dressed up in some kind of fancy artificial intelligence, na natural language processing, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's counting words from a list. So we're going to do that for you. Uh, but at the moment, I'm not that happy with tools that don't recognize that there is a network structure.